So returning to our framework of behavior, we can now begin to see what's happening on the left side of this diagram about how environmental cues and perception can lead to distinct actions by propagating information through different parts of the nervous system. Let's think now about the right-hand side of this diagram and think about internal states that can motivate behavior. And for that, I will talk about important internal states of sleep and arousal. Sleep is one of the important activities that humans do and that animals do. Humans sleep about eight hours a day, uh, usually at night. Some animals sleep in the night, some animals sleep in the day. But as we examine other animals, we see that even um, animals as simple as fruit flies can show sleep-like behavior and waking-like behavior. We can see this just by monitoring their activity levels. If we look at a fruit fly at light or in dark, we see that they move around a lot during the light and they rest during the dark. Interestingly, if you change a fruit fly from light-dark cycles into constant darkness, you see that it still follows a 24-hour rhythm. It moves around for about 12 hours, and then it rests for about 12 hours. This indicates that it has an internal biological rhythm, which is called the circadian clock. Seymour Benzer and Ron Kanopka decided to look for genes that affect the circadian clock in fruit flies. And they did this by searching for fruit flies whose 24-hour cycle was abnormal. And they were able to identify many classes of mutant fruit flies with abnormalities. Fruit flies, for example, that had no rhythm at all, that would just sort of fly around or sit still at random during the day and the night. Also, fruit flies that had a short cycle. When placed in constant darkness, instead of cycling for 20, in, over 24 hours, they would cycle over as few as 19 hours. And conversely, fruit flies whose cycle was long, where instead of cycling over 24 hours, they might cycle over 28 hours and, or more. So you can think of these 19 hours as sort of early risers, and these 28-hour guys as the flies who like to stay up late. Remarkably, all three of these mutations affected a single gene. There was one gene that, because of different kinds of changes in its activity, could either um, completely disrupt the rhythm, make it shorter, or make it longer. And that pointed to the fact that this gene must have a key role in determining the running of the circadian clock. And this gene is called PER for period. A series of molecular studies from many different labs has led to the elucidation of this circadian clock. Indeed, the PER gene is an important element of the circadian clock, but there are other molecules that are involved as well. These molecules function within the cell to regulate patterns of gene expression, and they regulate each other's gene expression through a negative feedback loop. So how this feedback loop works is that during the night, a transcription factor named clock drives the expression of the PER gene identified from that early fly screen. Early in the night, PER is unstable, but over time it becomes more and more stable and builds up. Its buildup during the night causes it to eventually accumulate at sufficient levels that it can enter the nucleus early in the day. And when PER enters the nucleus, what it does is to inhibit the clock gene that is turning PER on. Well, eventually that means that PER is going to run down again because the clock gene is no longer leading to its transcription. And so as the day wears on, PER becomes less active and clock becomes active again. So that night, clock can begin to make PER again. This feedback loop between these transcriptional regulators and other regulators that determine their levels is similar all the way from flies to humans. Within the nuclei of our cells are the same kinds of transcriptional regulators oscillating in the same patterns between night and day as are observed in the fruit fly. How do these genes affect our behavior? Why are we active at different times? It turns out that in humans, although many cells have these clock genes and have their own circadian clocks, there are specific brain regions in which these clock genes are important to dominate behavior. And these brain regions are buried deep within the brain in an area called the hypothalamus, and in particular, in a region of the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is what you might think of as the master clock. The activity of the clock genes 
in the suprachiasmatic nucleus regulate the physiology and behavior of animals. And so we have here the PER and the CLOCK gene oscillating in one region of the brain to then affect the outcome at the level of the whole organism. PER and CLOCK were discovered initially in flies um, and mice, but remarkably, in humans, the exact same genes can lead to changes in human behavior. So there is a sleep disorder called advanced sleep phase syndrome in which people have what you might think of as an extreme early morning lark um, behavior. They get up earlier and earlier every morning. They can't stay up late at night. They keep falling asleep. The reason is that these people have mutations in human PER genes that cause their clock to run too fast. They think that the day is only 22 hours long instead of 24 hours long, deep within their hypothalamus. And no amount of conscious control can help them to regulate all of their behavior accordingly. So the hypothalamus keeps a clock. It must be regulating lots of different behaviors as well. How does it go about transforming this information into different kinds of output behaviors? Well, again, focusing specifically on sleep, I'd like to tell you about a disorder of humans that's a complex and fascinating sleep disorder called narcolepsy with cataplexy. In narcolepsy with cataplexy, you can think of the sleep state as invading the waking state. So people with this disorder tend to fall asleep very quickly and at inappropriate times. They have hallucinations when they're awake sometimes because they're dreaming when they're awake. It's a sleep appropriate response is appearing while they're awake. And they can lose their muscle control very suddenly so their bodies relax in the same way you relax when you're asleep. This happens sometimes with excitement. Now very little was understood about the biology of human narcolepsy until certain dog owners noticed that their dogs had a disorder very much like human narcolepsy that they fell asleep inappropriately, and that they would collapse sometimes when they were excited. And Emmanuel Mignot, studying these dogs, was able to trace down the genetic changes that caused these dogs to have abnormal sleep-waking behavior. And what he found is that these dogs had a deficiency in a particular brain chemical called hypocretin that signals through a G-protein-coupled receptor called the hypocretin-2 receptor. Building out from this discovery and similar discoveries in mouse, we were able to make the discovery in humans that the exact same biological system is involved in human narcolepsy cataplexy as is involved in the dog disorder and in the mouse disorder. So there are neurons in the brain that make hypocretin. In human patients with narcolepsy and cataplexy, these neurons are typically lost through autoimmune destruction, leading to the loss of this peptide. The mouse mutants that I didn't tell you about that also have narcolepsy have a defect in the hypocretin gene itself. The dog mutant that I did tell you about, these rare dogs that have narcolepsy, have defect in the hypocretin 2 receptor. So what is this G-protein coupled receptor and what is the signal it detects? The signal it detects is something called a neuropeptide, a peptide made by one neuron to communicate with other neurons. Neuropeptides represent one of the three different ways that neurons communicate with each other. So neurons can communicate with each other at synapses through the process of fast chemical transmission that causes them to excite or inhibit each other locally and strongly. They can communicate with each other through electrical connections or gap junctions and they can communicate with each other through these secreted neuropeptides. Now neuropeptides, like classical transmitters, are secreted by one neuron and affect another, but they have certain differences. Classical transmitters are very fast. Neuropeptides are slower. Classical transmitters act at one synapse. Neuropeptides can act at a distance. They can broadcast information from one part of the brain to another. And while there are only a few classical transmitters that are used over and over again, there are many neuropeptides. And so individual neuropeptides, like hypocretin, can have rather specific functions, like regulation of sleep and waking. When we look at sleep behavior and its regulation by hypocretin, we see that within the human brain, with its billions of neurons, there are just 2,000 hypocretin-producing neurons. 
These are the neurons that are required to prevent sleep from invading the waking state. They're found deep in the hypothalamus, and they're closely connected with the neurons that drive the circadian clock. So the circadian clock in the hypothalamus com co communicates with other neurons in the hypothalamus that drive individual functions associated with the circadian clock, like sleep and waking. And then these neurons broadcast information all throughout the brain to many regions involved in sleep and arousal, in part by sending along processes to different regions, and in part because their neuropeptide products can actually diffuse some distance from the site of production. So sleep is an internally generated behavior that we can understand in the context of molecules for the circadian clock, molecules for hypocretin, circuits that regulate the circadian clock and that interact with the neurons that produce hypocretin, and also in terms of the brain and the behavior of the whole animal. So from, this is one example of an internal state and a motivation for behavior. In my final example of a framework for behavior, I'm going to talk about social behavior as a motivation for behavior. Now, social behavior is a characteristic of all animals. All animals must interact with other members of their species at certain key moments, for example, during mating behaviors that are required for reproduction. But social behavior, although it's widespread in animals, is also different in different animals. So that, for example, animals recognize their own species but not other species, and also so that animals in different species um, behave differently from one another in their social contexts. Moreover, even within the same species, animals will show different social behaviors depending on things like their age, their sex, their reproductive status, and those of the organisms around them. So this is an example of a behavior that shows variability, not just constancy. Now a nice example of social behavior's variability is illustrated by the behavior of different rodents that are sometimes called polygamous and monogamous rodents. These are two different kinds of rodents. They're called voles, and if you encountered them, they would look very similar to you, as shown by these different kinds of photographs. But if you examine their behaviors, you would see that these animals had really different social strategies. Meadow voles are what are called polygamous voles. These voles are largely solitary in their lifestyle. They, single males and females, will mate briefly and then scatter. There's very limited maternal care of offspring and no paternal care at all. And they also differ in other social behaviors. They're not territorial and they're not aggressive. By comparison, prairie voles are voles that will form pair bonds that will last for the entire life of a male and a female after a single mating. They live in large colonies. The mothers take very good care of the pups, and so do the fathers. They show paternal care of their offspring. In addition to their pair bonding, they also show territorial and aggressive behavior, distinguishing those within their own group from those of other groups. So these closely related rodents provide a way to think about what kinds of genetic changes might evolve to allow these two different species to have such different social behaviors. And that has been the mission of Tom Insel, Larry Young, and their colleagues at Emory University. What they found is that these differences in social behaviors were related to the functions of other important neuropeptides in the mammalian brain. In mammals, social behavior is regulated by two neuropeptides that are related to each other called oxytocin and vasopressin. Oxytocin is strongly implicated in maternal behaviors as well as certain forms of maternal physiology like nursing. Vasopressin is related to male behaviors. So each of these peptides exists in the brain. Each of them has its own specialized receptors that exist them, that detect them. What is the difference between polygamous voles and monogamous voles in these systems that allows them to behave differently? Well, both poly polygamous and monogamous voles have oxytocin and vasopressin, and both have receptors for oxytocin and vasopressin. So it's not the existence of these genes that differs. Instead, it's the way these genes are deployed in the brain that's different in species that show different behaviors. The difference between monogamous and polygamous voles comes when you examine the vasopressin and oxytocin receptors
in the brains of these animals and look at where in the brains these receptors are deployed. So this slide here shows sections through the brains of a monogamous foal and a polygamous foal. These are both males and they're sections at the same location of the brain. The bright colors, the greens and reds and yellows, illustrate locations at which the vasopressin V1 receptor is being expressed. And what's evident from looking at this is that while both of these species have the vasopressin receptor, they utilize the vasopressin receptor in different brain regions. The monogamous foal, shown at top, expresses the vasopressin receptor in regions that are involved in reward. And the rewarding presence of this receptor helps the bull to generate what you might think of as a positive association with its mate that promotes the formation of a pair bond. The polygamous foal, shown at bottom, does express a vasopressin receptor, but it expresses it in different brain regions that would not allow this animal to form a rewarding memory. And so the utilization of these receptors in different brain regions causes different kinds of associations to be built and different behaviors to result. So returning to the framework for behavior, I've tried to illustrate with a few examples how we can look at behaviors that are interesting between different animals and also behaviors that are shared by different animals and think about them in the context of genes, brains, and behavior. Our challenge now as neuroscientists is to ask how all of these processes, environmental perception, decision-making, action, memory, internal states and motivation, relate to the functions of different genes. How those genes relate to the functions, the development, and the flexibility of different parts of the brain, and how those brain systems work together to generate the behavior of an animal and ultimately the human. Thank you.